the beginning of January, we embarked on a journey in the book of Acts, and here we are, the beginning of November, only at chapter 12, but it has been a, a journey that has blessed us and encouraged us as we seek, uh, in many ways, to become like the early church described. And so I invite you to return your attention back to Acts 12 as we move through this passage together. But first, let us take a moment to unite our hearts, to prepare our hearts to hear the word of God preached. Let us pray. Father, we confess that the Bible is not an ordinary book, that though it has human authors, it has been breathed out by you according to your will and by the power of your Holy Spirit. And everything that is in the Scripture is there for our edification, sometimes to encourage us, sometimes to warn us, sometimes to set a positive example, sometimes to tell us what not to do. And Lord, as we come to Acts chapter 12, we recognize that our context is different from this first century context. But we also confess that what you have written long ago is entirely relevant for our life today, entirely authoritative for our life today. So apply this, your word, to our hearts and to our lives, to the glory of Jesus Christ, and in his name we pray. Amen. Some of you have commented on how much has changed in, in the years uh, that I've been here as, as the pastor of St. Andrew's Kirk, and one of the most obvious changes is actually a member of my household. When I, when I first came to Nassau, Bahamas, I came with a tiny little daughter, Anya, who's now away as a senior in university. But I want to tell you about a time when my daughter was very little. It was before we lived in Nassau, Bahamas. We lived in Toronto, Canada, and we lived across the street from a very large, we would call grocery store. Here we would say food store. And for the maybe the four Canadians among us today, it was Loblaws, one of the biggest franchises of grocery stores, at least in Ontario. So in, in those days, because the grocery store was right across the street, I, I would often bring Anya with me grocery shopping. Now, if you've ever gone grocery shopping with a toddler, you have some idea how complicated things can get. So here I am in Loblaws, and I'm picking things off the shelves, and I'm putting them in the cart according to the list that my wife, Allie, has given to me. So it's a very particular list, very particular items I'm pulling off the shelf and putting into the cart. So what, does, what do most toddlers do when they see their parents? They model or they emulate what is being modeled for them. And so Anya starts to take things off the shelf and put them into the cart as well. The trouble is, is what? She's pulling off things that aren't on the list. I'm only allowed to bring home what's on the list. What's, what's in the book, as it were. And so she's pulling off candy and chips and all kinds of sugary items. Now, just to negotiate, if she, she puts something with nutritional value in the cart, I would let it stay in the cart. But I knew I couldn't come home with the Skittles or the Starburst or the salt and vinegar chips. I knew those had to go back on the shelves. As you can imagine, and maybe you've been there yourself, you know this experience. Your toddler puts something in the cart, you remove it and put it back, and what happens? It's a little bit of an episode there in the middle of the food store. <laughs> Everyone's wondering, what did you say or do to this child to make them scream and yell and cry? It's uncomfortable. You see, Anya was convinced that everything she was putting in the cart was good, she looked at the Skittles, she looked at the Starburst, and she thought, it is good for me to have these things. I share this personal illustration because I want to think through a dynamic that exists in my prayer life. And it's a dynamic that might be in your prayer life as well. You see, every single day of my life, I ask God to give me things. 
things that I think are good. And so prayerfully, I'm taking things off the shelf, as it were, and I'm putting them into my cart, and I'm asking God to give me these things. And yet regularly, regularly, God in His sovereignty denies my requests and thwarts my choices. I know how Anya must have felt to have my choices thwarted. God, I, I'm asking you for things that I think are good. And he denies my request. Now, to be fair, there are occasions where God gives me exactly what I ask for in prayer. There are times when he gives me even abundantly more beyond all that I ask or imagine or request. More commonly... God delays his answer. He delays his answer to my prayer because he wants me to align my timetable with his. But quite honestly, and quite often, God regularly denies me the things that I ask for in prayer. There are times when God removes my request from the shopping cart, and he puts the item back on the shelf. I want us to identify this spectrum of response from God as we look at our passage today. Because I think your experience will match mine, that when you ask God for things, there is a spectrum of how he responds to each of us. We're reminded here in Acts 12 how in this life, we do not always receive from God what we ask for. We are reminded how even our earnest prayers do not necessarily prompt God to change our circumstances. I hope your Bibles are open to Acts 12 because it begins in an awful manner. At the beginning of Acts 12, we read about the tragic execution of of one of the most beloved apostles. Verse 1 and following, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. By the way, in case you're wondering, there, as you know, there, there are different James in the New Testament, prominent James in the New Testament. This is James, the brother of John, the sons of Zebedee. James is killed with the sword. Now, we confess that God is a way maker, don't we? We say that God can make a way where there is no way. But, we also ought to admit, looking at this passage, that God isn't obligated to yield to our requests just because He can and just because we'd like Him to. The Lord reminds us through the prophet Isaiah, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways. It's humbling to be reminded that we're not like God yet. We don't see the world the way He does. And this helps to explain how the life of James, the life of Stephen, and the life of John the Baptist are cut terribly short. You see, God is doing something good in the background that we're unable to see clearly. God is furthering His purposes through the deaths of His saints in a manner that's not easy to discern. I have no doubt that the disciples of John the Baptist were praying fervently for him while he was in prison. I have no doubt that prayers of deliverance were offered for Stephen. And for James, nevertheless, each of them are gruesomely executed. Now, before you get any more discouraged, some of you are thinking, what have I gotten into? 
sermons about gruesome executions and unanswered prayer? What is this all about? Before you become any more discouraged about God's willingness to answer your prayers, I need to lead you through the rest of Acts 12. Because here we read about how prayer is involved in the miraculous deliverance of Peter from prison. Luke tells us that shortly after James is executed, Herod had Peter arrested, put in prison, delivering him over to four squads of four soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people to be executed. That's the plan. Just like he killed James, he intends to kill Peter. But it's Passover. So Herod delays the trial, he delays the execution until the Passover festival is completed. But Peter's situation, make no mistake, it's bleak. With four sets of four guards taking turns guarding Peter, there appears to be no real possibility of escape. And then we come to verse 5, which is the turning point for our passage. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was being made to God by the church. Friends, do you see this? Peter's situation is dire, but earnest prayer for him was being made to God by the church. The context compels us to infer the obvious, that the church is praying specifically for Peter's release from prison. And I want you to notice these aren't token prayers either, but Luke specifies that it's earnest prayer that's being made on Peter's behalf. The people in the early church are praying with a sincere intensity that Peter would be released. Time is running out for Peter. His execution looms. Peter is in chains with guards at his side, guards in front of the cell, in front of the locked door. How is Peter coping? How is he doing with all this? Have a look at verse 6. We read in verse 6 that Peter is found sleeping. He's not anxiously tossing and turning, thinking about his trial and his execution. He's sleeping. Now, those of us who lie awake at night fretting about future events would do well to take note of Peter's disposition. Immediately prior to his trial and execution, Peter has evidently cast his cares before the Lord and is found sound asleep. Picture with me what the text is describing. Verse 7, An angel of the Lord appears in Peter's cell and shines a bright light. I don't know how your sleeping goes, but if, if someone so much as turns on a, a bedside lamp, or shines a little phone flashlight, I'm immediately awakened. But Peter is entirely unstirred by the presence of a heavenly angel who shines a bright light into his cell. It's humorous how Luke describes it. The angel has to hit Peter. It's almost like when you had to wake your teenager and the the shaking just didn't do it and you had to hit them a little. That's how Peter wakes up. The angel tells Peter to get up, and we're told immediately the chains fell off him. But Peter is so groggy that the angel has to remind him to get dressed. Come on, Peter, let's go. Let's get your sandals on. Peter thinks he's dreaming, but he discovers that he's been miraculously delivered. Luke then tells us, Peter went to the house of Mary, 
the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. So you can imagine this. There's a prayer meeting. They're all gathered together and they're praying for whom? Praying for Peter. They're praying for what? That he'd be released from prison, that it'd be a favorable sentence in the trial, that things would go his way, that the Lord would move the hearts of the judge and so forth. They're praying for Peter's release. You can imagine the considerable excitement that would be generated with Peter's arrival. But listen to what happens. When Peter knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. And they said to her, the prayer meeting people said to her, you're crazy, you're out of your mind. We're busy here praying for Peter, and you're trying to tell us that he's here. The irony of the response is potent. They're praying fervently for Peter's release, and they regard as insane the person who reports that their very prayers have been answered. And while the response of the prayer group is indeed ironic, their response shouldn't entirely surprise us. Because there are times when we pray while lacking the faith that God can and will do the very thing we're asking him. If Peter is truly at the door, that means a genuine miracle has taken place. And so when they finally let Peter in, Luke says, he describes their response, they saw Peter and were amazed. There must have been great excitement. There must have been, I imagine that there was applause. I imagine that they would stand and applaud, that they would hug Peter, they would cheer. I imagine that it was chaotically exciting when Peter entered the room, so much so that Luke says that he has to motion them to be quiet so that he could explain this miracle of deliverance. I want to unpack what the early church does well, but before we do that, I think we should pause and note the obvious. God saves Peter in response to the prayers of his people. This is an important lesson, that God rescues Peter miraculously because the people of God prayed for him. In other words, their prayers worked. Our prayers can work too. Commenting on this passage, Puritan theologian Thomas Watson writes, the angel may have fetched Peter from prison, but it was prayer that fetched the angel. Let's not give the angel all the credit here. Prayer fetched that angel. Don't we long for that experience? That, have you ever thought about when you're praying that in response God organizes his armies? That God organizes his angels? He commissions them because of your prayers? Because the clear biblical testimony is that prayer is often the means through which miracles come. Prayer is often the means through which miracles come. But the biblical testimony also reminds us that prayer is not some magic technique. It's not magic. It's not a technique that keeps us from experiencing hard things. We, we need to remember James, the son of Zebedee, was violently executed. And he was every bit as faithful an apostle as Peter was. It, it would be a mistake if we said, you know, it's Peter's just a better apostle. And that's why God rescued him and not James. No, we can't point to any merit or demerit. 
that would, that would show Peter to be more worthy than James. We cannot speak of merit and demerit to help us understand or explain the differing outcomes. Because we have this as well, don't we? We pray for one thing, and God denies our request. We pray for another thing, and he grants it. And we say, why? Why, Lord, did you give me this one thing I asked for, but deny me the other? As I understand this passage and as I understand the New Testament, the different outcomes can only be attributed to God's sovereign wisdom. God's sovereign wisdom determines why one prayer is answered and another is denied. Now, I know there may be some critical thinking uh, persons among us, and you'll say, well, why bother praying then? Why bother? If God's just going to do what he wants, if he's just going to act in accordance to his own will, why do I bother to pray? He denies me one thing because he's sovereign, and he gives me another thing. Why bother praying to him in the first place? Well, if God lacks the power... Sorry, let me put it this way. Here's why I pray. I pray because God is sovereign. Because if God lacks the ability to give me what I ask for, he's not sovereign and I shouldn't bother praying to him. If God lacks the ability to change a person's heart and to change a person's circumstances, why would I pray to him? I pray to God because he's sovereign, because he has the ability to change the affections and the will of human beings, to change the circumstances in our life. He is sovereign. I pray because God has the ability to do as he chooses. And God, who is sovereign over all things, in his sovereignty, has determined to respond in accordance to our prayers. You see, God, who is sovereign, has sovereignly appointed prayer as a means through which he hears us and responds to us. In other words, God, in his sovereignty, this is important, has chosen secondary means. God in his sovereignty has chosen secondary means. Let me give a few examples. God didn't simply ordain that there would be light in this world, but he also ordained the sun and the moon and the stars as the means through which there would be light. So God sovereignly ordains light and he sovereignly ordains that which provides the light. Friends, that's why when you get sick, you go to a doctor. You need surgery, you go to a surgeon. It's not that you don't think God could heal you miraculously. I believe he can. But I also believe that he sovereignly equipped doctors and surgeons as the means through which he can make you better. Just because God appoints secondary means does not take away from his sovereignty because God in his sovereignty has designed to move through those secondary means. What am I saying? Prayer is one of the most vital secondary means through which the Lord accomplishes his will. Let me give you some examples. How does God save people? He saves people through Jesus Christ and through the benefits of what he achieved on the cross and in his resurrection. But how do we get there? How do we get a person there? We pray for them. Prayer is the means through which God intervenes and changes a person's heart. Prayer is appointed as a means through which people are redeemed. Prayer is one of the means that God employs to make us more like his son. Prayer is the means through which a local congregation matures and grows numerically. 
Prayer is one of the means through which God heals or rescues a person from harm. God could just wave a wand, as it were, be saved, be healed, be rescued. But in His sovereignty, He uses His people. And in His sovereignty, He calls His people to pray. And that begs an obvious question. How should we pray? How should our prayers be marked? And our passage gives at least three principles for how we should pray. First, the people prayed specifically. We see this in verse 5. They prayed for him. They prayed for Peter. It wasn't just a general prayer that they were offering, but it was a specific prayer. They prayed specifically for Peter and for his release from prison. Secondly, they prayed earnestly. There was a passion to their prayer. There was an intensity to it. I take this to mean that our disposition in prayer matters immensely. This is important. To say a prayer is not necessarily to pray. Don't worry, I don't need that anymore. <laughs> to say a prayer is not necessarily to pray. We, we can put anyone. I could stand up here and pray or say a prayer, but it's not necessarily prayer unless that prayer is animated by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. There is a certain amount of passion and zeal and intensity that accompanies our prayer being powered by another. To say a prayer is not necessarily to pray. Our heart ought to be engaged. And thirdly, the people prayed together. The people prayed together. The first century Christians were committed to getting together on a regular basis for the purpose of prayer. And verse 5 states this explicitly. And I think this is also found in verse 12 explicitly. Now, that means that we don't imagine that the pastor does all the praying or that the elders do most of the praying. Nor should we limit ourselves to our private prayers. Our private prayers are good. Our private prayers are commanded. They're necessary. But Luke specifies in verse 12 that many were gathered together and we're praying. So pray on your own. That's good and necessary, but we ought to do more. We ought to gather and pray together. I want you to imagine what could change in our life, in this church, and in this country if we committed ourselves to praying specifically, earnestly, and together. How might the ministry of the Kirk be changed or enhanced? How might your relationship with Christ be changed and enhanced by praying with others? What miracle might God work in your life in response to an increased commitment to pray? I want to know the answer to that. And so I'll pray. I want us to pray specifically. I want us to name those things that we need God to do for us. We ought to pray earnestly. Just don't say prayers robotically. Wrestle with God in prayer. Engage your heart and your passions as you pray to Him. And when I say pray together, I don't simply mean in this building on Sunday morning. Do you all get together from time to time? Do you have Bible study together? Do you have coffee together? Do you go to one another's homes once in a while? Why not pray together? Why wouldn't we pray together when we have every opportunity? Because when we study the Scriptures, it becomes immediately clear the difference prayer makes. Prayer makes. 
Everything is enhanced. God's purposes are advanced when his people pray. Prayer is the means God has appointed for the advancement of his purposes. Oh, he could do it anyway. I know. He could do it just, again, waving that magic wand, as it were, but that's not what he's chosen to do. God in his sovereignty rarely, would I say, works apart from the secondary means of his people. Why? Because what are we? We are the body of Christ. We're not just a group of people. We're the physical representation of Jesus in this world. And so the reason he has appointed us is because of who we are. We are Christ. We represent him. Prayer is the means that he uses to change hearts. Think of that hard person in your life. Think of that person you struggle to get on with. Think of that person who, who you think is the least likely to come to know Christ. Pray for that person. Pray that God would change their heart. Because here's what I want to confess to you. I probably stand with maybe a dozen or more of you who would say that I would have been voted least likely to become a Christian. Look at me and say, oh, I don't believe that. Well, just that's because you see current Bryn McPhail. You don't know the pre-Christian version of this guy. And there's a pre-Christian version of, of many of you that's vastly different from who you are today. And you're thinking, well, how did I get from there to here? Some will say, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. But what, what caused the Holy Spirit to sovereignly intervene? I am certain that people were praying for you and praying for me that the Holy Spirit moved in my life and in yours because of the prayers of another. So I urge you, church, be that person who's praying specifically, earnestly, and with other people for the transformation of particular hearts and for the advancement of God's purposes. Let us do that unceasingly, and let us do it for God's glory. Amen.